Understanding design principles like data ink and data density allows us to make presentation choices that make our figures more efficient and effective. Now we're going to talk about graphical integrity. Statistics can lie, maps can lie, and even charts can lie. They lie and mislead intentionally, editorially, deliberately, ignorantly. They lie due to having the wrong data or insufficient amounts of data. Sometimes the graph maker just simply ignores conventions which can distort the messaging. One way to immunize yourself against making these mistakes and being taken in by faulty charts is to arm yourself with information and practice. Practice making and practice reading charts. I want to introduce this concept of confirmation bias. Um, this is an inclination to reinforce our opinions using, in our case, numbers and charts. Charts can lie because we often read too much into them. Charts can only say what's actually on the page. The rest of it is our interpretation, and we have to be careful with that. Sometimes we let charts, uh, charts lie to us because we see in them what we want to see. Um, Alberto Cairo said in his uh, new book, How Charts Lie, Charts lie to us because we're prone to lying to ourselves. So it's about kind of su surrounding ourselves with things that agree with our own opinion of the world. So here's a chart showing global average temperatures from 1997 to 2012. It looks very cyclic with no obvious trend, um, really just a fluctuating temperature that's uh, changing by tenths of a degree. On its own, this isn't misleading if the chart's purpose is to illustrate global temperatures during this exact time period. But if it's being used to undermine education about climate change and is designed to imply that global temperatures naturally fluctuate, then it's misleading by data omission. It's showing partial data. We certainly have reliable data going back farther than 1997. Uh, here's the exact same time period over on the right. And the data is showing the temperature anomaly or the difference between global temperature and the average for a period of time within the time range. Um, so it's a little bit different, but the trend is the same. And you can see that uh, a trend line has even been sketched in. Showing that same section, but in the larger context, um, data going back to 1961, which is still an incomplete data set, the trend definitely changes. And if we look, um, hopefully you're familiar with uh, a plot like this, um, global temperatures going back to 1880 when our record tape taking uh, became more consistent and reliable. This broader time span puts the data in the most complete context that we have. So again, it's up to the creator to determine the message and execute the charts, you know, execute them accordingly. Okay. Another way that charts can lie is by breaking an absolute rule. Bar charts, the axis needs to start at zero, period. No exceptions. So this is an old example, but I include it just because it's convenient. <laughs> it shows the graphic is designed to show the effects on tax rates if the book, uh, Bush tax cuts were allowed to expire. It's pretty alarming looking, right? I mean, it looks like taxes are going to be five times higher. But wait, the value axis starts, axis starts at 34% instead of zero. You don't do that with bar charts. Why? Because length is the visual cue. In this case, it's more area because the bars are so flipping wide. But we are comparing the relative heights of these things because of the consistent baseline. And so it looks like uh, when they expire, January 1st, there's going to be a five-fold increase. You have to be quick and notice the scale over here to know that that's an exaggeration. If they really wanted to go for drama, they could have started the axis at 34.9, and that would have been really something. So yeah, humans compare lengths and areas on bar charts. And so the bar chart value scale has to start at zero. Here's the same data but plot it up correctly or appropriately. I'm, I'm not saying it isn't an alarming increase, <laughs> but it's certainly not uh, designed to be shown like this. Okay, so saying that one time more, 
bar charts must have a zero baseline because we're comparing the lengths. Or you could say we're comparing the position from the baseline. OK, so on this chart, the value range starts at 10. See the y-axis. This means that the relative heights of the bars don't accurately correspond to the differences in values. That's where this gets misleading. Opera 11 isn't consuming twice as much power as Firefox 4, but it's made to look that way because of the truncated um, vertical value scale. This is, and I'm putting this in air quotes, a visual lie. Our eyes perceive differences, not absolute values. That's what's easiest for our brain to do, and we're going to talk about this a lot more um, specifically later. Um, and it's important to know that we perceive differences proportionally. So the difference between the two bars um, seems greater when they're smaller. It's because we're looking at the percent difference. And so this is another reason why it's so important to have bar charts that start at zero. Um, just so you know, there are alternatives to bar charts that will alleviate the need to start the value range at zero. But again, it comes down to your, your messaging. So here's these two plots are showing the same data. The horizontal bar chart on the left with the scale starting at zero. And on the right, it's the exact same data, but the values are being represented by lines marking the salary values. But because we're now only reading the position along a common scale, we don't need to start the value scale at zero because our brain isn't encoding a length of this thing, it's encoding a position. So I, I, I'm going over a lot of examples and trying to use the same rhetoric and, and hoping that it'll start clicking. Um, but it, it really, they're both completely correct the way that they are. But the line markers exaggerate the differences between the salaries a lot more, which may help with your messaging or may work against you depending on what story you're trying to tell. So bar chart rules of thumb, begin the scale at zero, period. It says comma, it should be a period. <laughs> you should end the scale a little above the highest value. There should be something a little bit higher than the tallest bar. And the um, beginning and ending values on the scale axis should have round numbers and the intervals should be nice and round, not funky fractional things. Do we always need a zero baseline? No, don't become a slave to the zero point on a value scale. Line charts don't need to have a zero baseline. When we read line charts, we're comparing angles, and so we don't need to go to the zero. We're not misleading people. Um, another thing to be aware of, when you can control the axis scale, you need to do so wisely. Look at how much ink has gone into the detailed labeling of the temperature on the y-axis, from negative 10 degrees up to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And yet none of these numbers are being used except the small range between 55 and 56 degrees Fahrenheit. In fact, most of the page isn't being used. This is almost comical, but this is a real chart that was put out there to debunk climate change. Um, and this, this is a common chart to make, plotting temperature changes over time. Um, and this one happens to be showing global temps in Fahrenheit for uh, our current period of reliable record, 1880 to 2010. So not totally contemporary. So how and why is this misleading? It's intentionally exaggerating the rate of change in global temperatures. It implies that global temperatures have barely budged, and yet the problem with this is that we know that even these very small increases in global temperature are having massive, serious effects on natural systems all around the world. This is a very silly and dangerous chart, in my humble opinion. Okay, another thing to pay attention to when you're plotting things up um, so that you don't end up arbitrarily exaggerating or under-exaggerating. Um, aspect ratio. Aspect ratio is the ratio between the width and the height of a rectangle. So it's typically expressed as a fraction with the width divided by the height. So an aspect ratio of 1 to 1 describes a square. You guys have seen this on your TVs, your monitors. 4 to 3, 16 to 9 are um, classic landscape aspect ratios. 
When you apply this to a visualization, the aspect ratio describes the area that's occupied by the data in the chart, even if the overall chart area might be larger. So it really just has to do with how you're stretching the x and y axis. The change in the aspect ratio means a change in the angle of the lines because the spacing of the plotted points gets stretched. So here you're looking at three different aspect ratios of the exact same data. And notice how the line segments have very different slopes. So the question is, which one's right? And unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for you. So altering the aspect ratio, as has been done to the data set shown on the left, really changes the appearance and maybe even the meaning of the data. Oopsie, sorry. Um, so the top aspect ratio in A, this is one that exaggerates the height and makes the changes appear steep. And this might lead a reader to interpret the changes as more important than they actually are. When you exaggerate the width, it flattens the line, which can make the changes in the data seem small and insignificant. Sometimes you don't know the right thing to do, and you have to experiment a little bit. Um, you definitely don't want to change aspect ratios just to conveniently make plots fit into open spaces on your page. You have to let the data drive your decisions. Um, there aren't any specific rules for choosing an aspect ratio, um, kind of. Um, there is a rule that if you're showing the same variable on both axes, like sometimes we do with um, temperature, for example, then you have to space both the x and y axis the exact same. They, they need to be, it needs to be a square, basically. Um, but it does depend on the nature of your data and the goals of your graphic. And just, I guess, most importantly, you need to be aware of the effects of aspect ratio. If you're a real stickler for rules, Will, William Cleveland of the Cleveland and McGill's effectiveness rating things that I showed you last time, they devised, he had devised a rule called banking to 45 degrees. And that's what this is showing. It basically means using an aspect ratio that gives the slopes of our lines an average angle of 45 degrees. Why 45? because most people can estimate that angle with a certain amount of accuracy. So you kind of want to shoot for overall angle of 45 degrees, but that's a little bit hard to employ sometimes. Okay, we talked about cumulative charts in a previous video, and so this is just a reminder that if you aren't aware of the difference between revenue and cumulative revenue, or if you don't give the chart your whole attention, even if it's just long enough to realize what you're being shown. You might be misled into thinking that, like in the first chart, re that revenue is steadily increasing over time. But in fact, it's not. And we looked at an example like this before. So you need to be aware of cumulative charts. This is Tim Cook at a presentation that he gave at Apple in 2013. Cumulative iPhone sales looks awesome. This is cheerleading at its best. But actually, at best, this chart is quite misleading. Um, at worst, it's disingenuous. First of all, the chart has no scale. It could be showing billions or hundreds of iPhone sales. Um, in addition to the messaging of cumulative sales, when we're talking about iPhones, it doesn't even account for the number of people who are replacing older broken iPhones. So this, this really isn't very well done. Now, hopefully, he's standing there providing all that information, including units, and talking through some of those things. Uh, okay. Here is the same plot with an overlay. The overlay shows that although Apple can boast more than 400 million iPhones sold for all time, quarterly sales have declined over the last three quarters. You can see that here. Uh, it's also worth noting that the chart shown gives a preview of Apple's sales ahead of its fourth quarter earnings. And you can see that the change in slope um, probably implies that iPhone sales had continued to decline. I could look this up, but convenience. All right, next I want to talk about ignoring conventions. Misleading by ignoring conventions. So you know by now that pie charts, if reflecting percents, need to total up to 100%. The percentages on this chart must relate to something, but presented the way they are, that doesn't make any sense at all. 
this one is an elegant looking chart, really, truly elegant, conveying information about the number of murders committed using guns in Florida. I mean, even the use of red is really stunning. Um, I think that at first glance, this is really uh, well done, but there are some serious problems with this. What it reads like is that despite a couple of small upticks here, in, since the early 2000s, gun deaths are on the decline in Florida. Where are they? Wait a minute, what are these numbers here? So in 2005, Florida ena enacted the Stand Your Ground law, and the number of murders by guns plummeted after that. That's kind of unexpected. But wait, the y-axis is upside down. That's called breaking with convention. The lower numbers of gun deaths is even colored red, which further misleads and hides what the data is actually saying, that the number of murders actually spiked from, I don't know, 520 to over 800 this year. So conventions, they matter. If someone doesn't take the time to read this and notice some of these inconsistencies, it can be very misleading. Okay. Above all else, I think it's important to tell the truth. Uh, the representation of numbers should be directly proportional to the numerical quantities measured. This is the idea of lying by distortion. Tufty coined the phrase, the lie factor. It's the idea of distorting data with graphics that aren't accurate or representing scale incorrectly. And for those of you who want to see this in graphic form and like equations, here you go. It's the size of the effect in the graphic relative to the proportional change in the data. Right. Uh, the, the equations, these equations that I'm showing you guys aren't necessarily important in and of themselves. Like, I don't expect you to calculate lie factors about the graphs that you look at, but um, I show them to you because it might help you understand the concept to see it written out this way. Here it is in, pra in practice in a graphic. Um, unfortunately, it's a fuzzy low resolution graphic. Uh, okay, so This graph shows fuel economy standards for cars from 1978 to 1985, all right? That's the quote unquote vertical axis over here. Um, 18 miles per gallon in 1978 increased to 27 and a half required miles per gallon in 1985. So miles per gallon is on the X axis. So imagine these are bar charts. It's like a bar chart going out this way. The 3D perspective is distorting the information a lot. The length of the line representing 18 miles per gallon is 0.6 inches long on the page. The line equaling 27.5 miles per gallon in 1985 is 5.3 inches long. In order to represent this actual change in value from 18 to 27 and a half, 27 is 9 more than 18, or 1 and a half times bigger. 1 and a half times longer than a line that's 0.6 inches long is a line 0.9 inches long, not a line that's 5.3 inches long. So we've got this clever graphic that has perspective introduced into it that's exaggerating the change over time. Um, this is what Tufty calls a lie factor, and if you calculate it out, it's a lie factor of almost 15, which again, doesn't necessarily mean anything, but is something to be aware of. And it's a way to quantify the exaggeration in a graphic. So there's obviously editorializing going on for the sake of this catchy cartoon. But again, I just want you to see that this is the concept of the lie factor. Proportional changes in values should be represented with proportional differences in how the data are rendered. And granted, the change in the length of a line from 0.6 inches to 0.9 inches wouldn't be very exciting, but it would be true. Okay, here's how that data would look if it were put on a time series line plot. And no, the miles per gallon on the y-axis don't need to start at zero. And yes, miles per gallon should be written right there with the values from zero to 30. 
<laughs> we do need to have some units there. Okay, here's another example. Each data point, which is the price of a barrel of oil in any given year, is represented by a picture of a barrel of oil. So if we just looked at this as a two-dimensional drawing, the lie factor would be about nine, calculating it out the same way. Again, that's comparing the 2D surface area covered by the drawing of the barrel, like if we counted the actual pixels. But the metaphor presented by a 3D barrel causes the viewer to think about the volume capacity of each barrel. The capacity of the 1979 barrel is 27,000% more than the 1973 barrel, even though the price only increased by 550% during that same time, which is a lie factor of almost 50. Take home message, avoid distortion. Okay, so here's a list of red flags, things to help you spot dubious charts. A lack of clear axis labeling. Your labels need to be, or your axes need to be labeled. Truncation of an axis so it starts or ends in a misleading place. Bar charts must start at zero. Numbers not adding up correctly, especially in pie charts, breaking with um, known conventions, poor use of a graph type, like making a series of bar charts when a line graph would be clearer, cherry picking data, lack of temporal context, um, bad graphic choices like low contrast color choices or distorting perspective, not including a title, not having sources, um, not having a legend for the information in a graph. These are big red flags. And I leave you with this doozy. Take a moment to spot the infractions. So this is a chart showing us job loss by quarter. We have a source, the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, but not really. The, da the data may have been pulled by there, but it was pulled incorrectly and it was misused. So first of all, it says job loss by quarter. These aren't really quarters. Um, the first, they're kind of randomly spaced time divisions. The first represents eight or nine months. The second one, six or seven months. The, the next one is like 15 months. So they're not, they're not evenly spaced. Um, second, inconsistent Y scale. Did you catch that? If we count the number of pixels between the change from 7 million to 9 million, it's 138 pixels. When we jump from 9 million to 13.5 million, it's four and a half million jobs lost, represented by 172 pixels. So the proportion is not um, being shown correctly. That could be a simplification just to show the general upward trend, but it's definitely not good practice. It's going to make people doubt your work and um, mistrust. Now, granted, these these kinds of images aren't up on the screen for very long, so you know the most that a reader can usually do is get a quick glance and then you're left with that impression. And that's when the damage can get done. Um, most importantly here is that the title is incorrect. It says that these numbers are jobs lost by quarter. We already know it's not by quarter, but these also aren't jobs lost. Wait, what? Uh... Okay, so this is the actual graphic supplied by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, you can see that there was a steep increase in unemployment during the first six months of Obama's presidency, but then there was a plateauing. And that's what was lost by just simplifying and creating that general upward trend line. And it's not, um, it's not job loss, there were unemployment numbers. And that's kind of a big deal because if the number of unemployed went from 13 and a half in March of 09 to 15 million in June 10, that's a difference of one and a half million jobs. So the chart implies that an additional 15 million jobs were lost in that period of time, and that isn't the case. The intent here was probably to start the discussion about Obama's stimulus package, which was about to be released. This graphic makes it look like job losses um, and or unemployment were increasing with absolutely no sign of stopping. But um, like we saw in this one, that, that wasn't the case. So we were generalizing um, and losing this important piece of information. 
This example and some of the others I've shown definitely single out Fox News, but a lot of news outlets are guilty of creating misleading plots like this one, not just Fox. So whether or not you watch Fox News isn't the point. What matters is that we as consumers need to recognize how information is being presented to us. And we need to know how easy it is for data gurus to tweak information in order to tell a completely different story with the exact same data. Just a little bit of lightheartedness for you. Okay, so Tufti's three principles of graphic integrity. Number one, be clear, detailed, and thorough in labeling in order to defeat distortion and ambiguity. Number two, physical differences between values on the graphic should be proportional to the numeric differences in the quantities represented. Number three, focus on showing data variation, not design variation. Number four, and above all else, don't lie. I really like this quote a lot. Freedom depends upon citizens who are able to make a distinction between what is true and what they want to hear. This goes back to the first concept that we talked about. I believe that we all do share a strong belief in the freedom of speech, but I think it starts to get interesting when you think about how freedom of speech applies to graphs and charts and maps in the mass media. You know, where is that line between careless and unethical and even harmful? Just a little food for thought to leave you with. 